everybody and welcome to another Houdini tutorial. Um, today we're going to be building an abstract kind of space nebula using Pyro and Houdini. Um, you may have seen my posts on Facebook or on the community page on YouTube where I've shown this nebula that I've made and today we're going to walk through it. So you can see it's sitting right at the center zero zero here and it's almost like a little puff cloud and it's got a lot of lights in here. And we'll walk through the lights in the cameras a little bit later because there's some more facts inside of them that I wanted to talk about regarding um, actual nebulas and how they're photographed or how NASA uses the Hubble Space Telescope to photograph them and what they have to account for when it comes to like light dis distortion and other matter that gets in the way. So let's get started. And also I apologize if you hear any noises in the background. We have a foster rabbit and he is very loud. So let's dive inside. So I've created a geometry uh, object node and inside I've just added a sphere. And here are pretty much the settings for it. I didn't really change too much. I think I'm just gonna turn off lighting for now so it's a lot easier to see what's going on. I'm not sure what that is, but let me double check. Yes, it's a light. So yep, I've turned up the frequency and the uniform scale. Nebulas are quite large, so the scale of it should be quite large for the emitter object. Added some noise and an attribute noise, something like that. The next thing I added was a scatter. And I added about 3000 points and got it to sample the density attribute, which is the color in this case, or the CD. And then I deleted all the attributes, which is essentially just color at this point. So by uh, this point going into the pop net, you should only really have your position. So let's go into the pop net. On the surface here, I didn't really change too much. It's just the same as a regular pop net should look like. Inside, let me just hit L on my keyboard, to straighten things out. I've changed the emission type to points. And for the birth, I just kind of left it alone. I added a pop axis force at zero, zero. Um, if you're creating a nebula that isn't at zero, zero in your scene, I would recommend using maybe a, I think it's a pop curve force where you can just um, create another curve and then plug it in here based on the first context geometry and the second and so on. But that's a good way to replicate this one. This one is very position centered. So on the changes on this one, all I did was up the orbit speed, lift speed, and turn the suction speed down to negative two, and change the radius and the height to this. I then added a wind force, and another wind force, and then some gravity, just so it didn't get too far. I guess you could also replicate the gravity with a pop drag if you wanted to. But in this case, this worked just fine for me. I'm gonna change my display down to A4, just for now so you guys can see the particles better. And you get this kind of almost seashell kind of effect with your particles. And I'll play it back for you so you can see what's going on. And that's about it. For the pop net. I then added a trail for about 10 um, and then all that did was just create these big long trails where the particles are starting from. I then time shifted everything to about frame 123 or 1, 2, 3. You just choose whatever frame you like and you work from there. And then I deleted all the attributes except for the velocity. And you'll see why in a bit why we need this velocity. But if you look here, the velocity should all be pointing inwards, and then hopefully the smoke will follow the velocity that's added onto your points. And that's just the general idea. I then added a particle out, and then the tricky bit started with the pyro simulation. So one way you can create a pyro simulation inside your object node is by, is by doing this. And I'm just going to move everything over here, just for now. And I'm going to add a 
.NET, just so you can get a general idea of how I added this setup inside this node. So at, with this particle out node is selected, I went inside the .NET, then I hit Object, I went to my Pyro Effects tab up here, and then I click Fair Billy Smoke. And you should see something start to happen. So you can see inside of dotnet 2, it's now created a fully functioning smoke simulation. And that's basically how I got these dotnets and this rasterize out density all in the same node. Uh, but you will notice down here, I have the pyro fields and the import pyro fields into here. And all I got, all I did for there is go up here, a pyro import node should appear after you create your sim. As I grab these, I copied them, and then I just pasted them onto my particles net. And that was pretty much it. So I'm just gonna delete this, and we'll get back into the regular sim. I actually don't think we need this render node, so you could actually just delete it, delete it if you wanted to. So when the pyro effect um, starts and creates this little out density area here, what you'll need to do is just go through here and make sure your settings are correct and the way you'd like them to be. I didn't really change too much on the create density, on the add noise, nothing really changed there. Those are just the settings that it gave me. And for the rasterize, these are the settings that I changed it to. And everything was good to go after that. The next thing I did was go over to my .NET. And this will be really slow, depending on the settings that you set it to. So don't be afraid about that. Currently for my high res sim, I've set a division size of 0 0.09. If you are working with this and creating changes to your simulation, I recommend maybe keeping this at a one, two, simply because it goes a lot faster. So I'm just going to keep this actually at a 0 0.14, just so we can sim through this and you can see how it grows and the different frames it creates. For the resize container, I just turned off max bounds. I didn't do any changes from there. From this, I upped the density. So I scaled the density to 1.8 and the velocity to a three. So here it's just sampling the velocity that we created on our points, and that's what I wanted. In the Pyro Solver, I did a bunch of different changes. So in the Simulation tab, I turned down the temperature diffusion to 0 0.04, the buoyancy lift to 0 0.03, and the buoyancy direction to 0 0.45 in the y-axis. Combustion did not change that. And just on the shape tab, that's as far as I went for changes. So I turned the dissipation down to this, disturbance to a three, and the turbulence I kept at a 0 0.25. And this was the curve that I added for my dissipation. And the block size I upped to a 0 0.9. And those are pretty much all the changes that I made. So I'm going to sim through this just so you guys can get a general idea of how this works. Okay, so when we're back. So basically I've simmed it out for a few frames. I actually had to go back down to our little smoke object here and turn down, turn up the division size to 0 0.21 um, as I found like um, 0 0.14 was a little bit uh, too slow. So this is what it look, kind of looks like around frame 63 and 67. It just kind of grows outwards. So if we jump up here and go to our import pyro visualization, I chose to use this one because we're only really using the density of the smoke. We're not using any of the other different visualization fields. So the rest or the temperature or the velocity. So I'm just, I just kind of use this one. You could use either or, it's up to you. So if I, I went to my file cache here, I laid down a file cache. And I just kind of simmed everything out. Um, it takes a little bit longer than you would like. Uh, I kind of tried to sim it out past one, two, three frames, but um, that didn't go so well. So if we just kind of play this back on our file cache, we should see something. 
I think, once again, it's super slow because you have to remember, like, it's a, a very, very detailed smoke sim. And this file cache is holding, like, the full res version anyway. So this is kind of what the full res version will kind of look like. And I'll go to my background, turn it to dark, just so you can see the shape of it. And it kind of looks like almost, I want to say Orion because of the shape. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of the Orion Nebula, that's what it kind of reminds me of. But it kind of, it does render almost like the Eagle Nebula with that shape. So it's going to be interesting. Um, once you see the final res result. So that's kind of what it looks like. And I've time shifted everything to the last frame. So it's just holding on the last frame for the entire sequence. And this time shift also has the render flag on it as well. So you're rendering from... So if we jump out here, we've got this displayed. This could say particle smoke, whatever you liked it, liked it to say. So I've changed this geometry velocity blur to velocity blur, none of the other two options, and I've added material, which is a billowy smoke shader. So the shader is kind of up to you of how you'd like to go about it, but the one thing I would recommend is turning down your emission to zero because you really don't really need to visualize the temperature of it. The smoke color is almost a pure white, or it is. Density, haven't changed a thing. And then down here, I've just kind of remapped the color from this type of blue to this blue. And that's pretty much it for the materials of it. The rest of it is down to lighting. So I'll render this out. And I've created two different camera views that I'm going to explain very shortly um, of how I wanted this to look. So we'll go take a look at cam three, which is the camera I used to render the thumbnail for this video. And you can take a look at the transformations on the camera here. So while that's rendering out, rendering out I'll explain what I've done. And also a little bit of a backstory to nebulas and how they're actually photographed by NASA and the European Space Agency and others. So basically when NASA takes a photograph of a nebula, they have to account for something called light distortion. And the light distortion happens mainly out of one or two or multiple things that go on in our universe. And one of them I'll discuss more frequently because I've just written an article on it that I'll link below. But when dark matter, there's a thing called dark matter in the universe and it's, it makes up about 67 to 82% of the universe. And when we can't see it, it does not emit light. It does not um, transfer light through it. There's some theories of what it actually is, but basically it's matter that exists. It holds everything together. Um, it holds all visible matter together and it prevents galaxies that are moving and spinning from breaking apart. So it's quite important in our universal structure. But the one problem that dark matter causes is it causes a light distortion for all light that passes through it. Um, so it either gets pushed around it or it gets stopped by this unseeable mass. So NASA, when they photograph something, it isn't always correctly um, observable as if we were standing right in front of a nebula. The other thing NASA has to take account for uh, when they're photographing a nebula or a galaxy or something is that light ta travels at its own speed. So I think most of you have probably heard of something like the speed of light or astronomical units or something like that. And so when light travels, if we were to take a picture of a star now, we're actually seeing that star, it, how it existed in the past, not currently the present right now because of how fast the light is traveling to us and how old the star is and there's a bunch of different factors. But one thing that happens when we finally take a picture is that there's usually a distortion of something on whatever thing we choose to visualize. So sorry, that was a long, a long explanation and there's a bigger space rant I could give about it, but in order to kind of mimic that effect, you do have to go to projection and you have to change it to a polar, cylindrical, or a lens shader. So in this case, I'm using a lens shader to kind of mimic this distortion. And I've just changed my aperture, clipping, everything here to match that. So here are the transformations again. So we'll take a look at 
camera four, which also has that similar distortion on it as well. So here is um, a kind of a side view of the nebula. It's very uh, messy and it's got these kind of uh, it's very huge kind of spiral-esque things pointing upwards. And you can kind of see our stars somewhere else on the other side. But it does show you in perspective, if you're t to tilt this from the side, how the different kind of pillars would appear. So everything appears differently based on the angle that is traveling in space, I guess, or how you're viewing it from your perspective on the Earth. These are the changes for that camera, and this is like the translation for it. So let's talk about the lights for a sec. And I think I'm going to go back to camera three for this because it's going to be easier to see. So we'll let that render out. Hello everybody, uh, sorry about that. Houdini crashed while I was rendering. So we're just going to take a look at the lights, um, the way they are in the scene, very quickly. So I'm going to go to my camera, actually I'm not going to look through a camera for this. I'm just going to go over here to my main viewport so you can see them better when I turn them on and off. See, you can't really see this one. So for this extra light, this one is mainly for camera four. Um, you may have noticed in, if I was to render this out, you'll see like a very faint kind of in the background glowy orb thing. And that's where that extra area light is coming from. And I'll just show you quickly what that is. So this thing right here over here and that I'll wait I'll show you the transformation so this is the intensity and the transformation is this area light over here basically all this is is creating another greenish glow that is more visible in our camera 3 render so if we hit this over here the transformation is that the point light center is exactly how it sounds so that bluey glow little thing in the center that's what that is and here's the transformation the blue light line thing is actually illuminating this section over here of the render. So it's creating that kind of faint blue glow. And this is the transformation. The green light is exactly what it sounds like. This is the green light down here. And then this is the transformation. Point light is just capturing some regular light to highlight the shadows. And then this is the transformation as well. And ambient light because I wanted the shadows to be softer and then I also added a distant light so basically this is just projecting the direction of the shadows overall and then I rotated it a bit and translated it a bit so it's actually behind the nebula pointing away from it if that makes any sense but yeah that's the end of the tutorial I hope you enjoyed it my name is Kate and I'll see you in the next video bye